got it. Great. Thank you, Carl. Hi, everybody. I'm Penny Laughlin. Welcome to Repair Rivertown Episcopal Parishes Action on Inclusion, Inclusion and Race. Um, and as you know, tonight's topic is banned books. But before we get started, a little bit about who we are. Uh, Repair is a faith-based organization whose mission is to work for healing and justice. We seek opportunities for active engagement to address racial and economic injustice, both on our own and in partnership with other organizations in our communities. We support our work through education and dialogue in an atmosphere of mutual respect. Repair respectfully acknowledges the ancestral homelands of the Lenape and other related tribes in the River Towns region from Dobbs Ferry to Peekskill and beyond. We recognize their ongoing cultural and spiritual connection to this land, past, present, and future. A little bit about our group norms. Um, for those of you who've been part of Repair for a while, these, haven't, uh, these have been pretty consistent and we moved them into the Zoom space a couple of years ago. We listen to understand, not to convince. We speak from, we ask you that you speak from your own experience and share the stage. Lean into discomfort. Some of these topics are ones that we aren't often given the opportunity to speak about. So, you know, we ask that you just lean into that and participate to the fullest of your ability. We ask that you honor confidentiality, certainly the, the ideas and thoughts that are shared here. We hope that you would expand and amplify those in your communities, but in terms of personal stories that are shared by participants, we'd ask that you honor that confidentiality. Ask for do-over if you realize your words were inelegant, and this is a brave space, just say it. There's a few specific Zoom rules of the road. Um, if you have a question or comment, um, as Carl mentioned earlier, I'll be checking the chat window on Zoom. So please write your questions or comments there. Um, as Carl mentioned, we're a small enough group that at some point we'll probably just open it up. Um, but if there are questions you'd like um, or comments you'd like to keep track of, just use the chat. To reduce background noise, your microphone would be muted until you're called upon to speak. Um, and we recommend setting your Zoom page to speaker view to better follow the discussion. And as you know, we'll be recording this meeting for posting on our YouTube channel. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin for our opening prayer. You have to take yourself off mute, Kevin. Sorry, trying to just get to my, there we go. I had my notes and it's taken up the whole screen, okay. Uh, pray with me. <clears throat> Almighty God, you proclaim your truth in every age by many voices. Direct in our time, we pray those who speak where many listen and write uh, what many read, that they may do their part in making the heart of this people wise, its mind sound, and its will righteous. To the honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, I'm Carl Weber, a member of our organizing committee, and I'm going to lead tonight's conversation on the theme of what's so scary about a book, pushing back against the book banners. And what we decided to do this evening was have a program about a disturbing recent trend in our society, which is a rise in attempts to ban books, some of them unfortunately successful. And it's relevant to our work in repair, because as we'll see through our dis discussion tonight, uh, there's a sense in which the battle to ban books is also a front in the battle for uh, racial justice and uh, racial equality, that uh, the tools that are used to ban books are used to ban ideas about race, racism, and America's racial history uh, that are really damaging to our efforts to uh, bring about greater inclusion and justice for all people. So it's it's very relevant to the work that we do in repair, um, even though book banning on its surface might seem uh, like a, a different kind of topic. We are going to encourage questions and comments from all of you as we uh, go through this evening's discussion. Uh, we'll begin with me presenting some uh, basic information about how book banning has been working and what this current trend of book banning looks like. And we're also gonna spend part of the evening talking about some of the banned books 
that have been getting the most attention from the banners. And we're going to, uh, we on the organizing committee have each selected um, one favorite or valuable book uh, from the, the roster of banned books that we feel is particularly valuable that we want to recommend and tell you a little bit about. And we'll, uh, we're hoping that those of you who are attending uh, will also uh, take advantage of the opportunities uh, this evening to mention books of your own that perhaps uh, have uh, been very meaningful to you in your own education about life and in particular about the quest for racial justice because uh, that is our, our, our mission here at Repair. So let's begin looking at this book banning trend and, uh, and discuss what we all need to know about it. Because I think many of us have heard a little bit about the story, uh, but we don't all know the full dimensions of how book banning is working and how it's affecting our society. And uh, uh, we will be sending out, as we usually do after our meetings, a special edition of our newsletter with a number of resources, one of which is uh, a, a, a very good Washington Post article recently published about the book banning trend. And some of the information I'm gonna be sharing in the next few minutes is drawn from that article. And one of the questions they discuss in that article is what is the difference between a book challenge and a ban? Because you often will see discussions of books that are either banned or challenged. And we will be using both terms this evening, um, uh, often under the catch-all phrase of banning, but challenging and banning are two different things. A book challenge refers to an attempt to remove or restrict printed materials based on their content. And when a book is challenged, it can be affected in terms of its accessibility uh, in a number of different ways. So for example, uh, in, in, in a school or a library, some passages could actually be removed from a book that remains in circulation, or it could be restricted and available only to certain individuals of a certain age or with special permission or it could be removed from one collection and moved into another. All of those are some of the possible impacts of a book challenge. An outright ban occurs when a book is removed from the library or from the school curriculum or otherwise forbidden to be accessed by particular people. So that's the difference between a challenge and a ban. Obviously there's kind of a gray zone between the two and both could be considered quite concerning to people who are believers in free access to information and to civil liberties. So both challenges and bans can be problematic, but it's important to know the difference. Also notice that we're gonna be focusing this evening on governmental actions as opposed to actions by private organizations and individuals for a number of reasons. One is that the first amendment of the constitution uh, does focus on government action and does not place restrictions on what private organizations can do. So when Facebook or uh, Instagram or Twitter uh, put restrictions on what people can write or publish uh, in those social media, that is not a violation of the First Amendment because the First Amendment governs what, what governments can do. You might object to something that Facebook does on free speech grounds, but it is not a First Amendment violation. Um, and in addition, there is a qualitative difference between what government can do and what private organizations might do. Um, governments are powerful. They have the entire force of the state behind their actions. And in the private sphere, there are almost always a number of competing uh, organizations that can fill in gaps when one group uh, does not want to make a particular message accessible. So if, for example, from my own industry of book publishing where I, where I work, if one book publisher refuses to publish a particular author, chances are good that that author will be able to get a contract with one of the many, many other book publishers that are around. Whereas if the government of a particular country or state uh, may take some kind of action against an author or a particular idea, that person may have no place to turn. Uh, so there are qualitative differences between what governments can do and what private organizations can do. Um, and we need to be mindful of those differences whenever we're looking at issues of free speech. Um, judgment as to what kind of speech should be limited and how is always necessary and important. 
uh, when we talk about book banning as a problem, I think all of us in our minds might still agree that there are going to be certain circumstances where certain kinds of books shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be disseminated in a particular context. So you wouldn't want a high school teacher assigning Mein Kampf to all of his students and spending the entire semester studying the, work, the works of Adolf, Adolf Hitler, for example. Uh, whether that constitutes book banning or not is a complicated question, but the, the point being that uh, there are recognized limitations to free speech, but what we're gonna be looking at is patterns of behavior and certain types of books and ideas that seem to be getting the brunt of the book banning. And that's where uh, it becomes a problem for in, in the quest for justice in our society. Uh, and Ginny, I'm gonna ask you, uh, as I'm continuing this conversation, please jump in if there's a comment or question on chat that uh, you'd like to bring into the conversation. Okay, Ginny? Okay, thank you. Um, the, the second question that is important for us to think about to understand how book banning works is, what is the process for challenging books? And it is important that there should be a process in place for challenging books because governments uh, do have an impact on the way books are disseminated and made available in our society, particularly in a couple of places such as in public libraries and in public schools, which means that judgments about how books get disseminated do need to be made and people may in some cases correctly feel they want to express their opinion about the appropriateness of a particular book being used in a particular way. So the kind of, of process that's in place and the way that's carried out becomes quite important. The National Coalition Against Censorship, which is a free speech organization, as well as the American Library Association, which is one of the organizations in the forefront of the battle for freedom of the press. These two organizations offer best practices to guide the review process for challenged books. And some of the steps in the process that they recommend include the following. Those charged with reviewing a book should read it in full and not select passages that lack, lack context. Challenged books should not be removed while they're under review. And committee members should write a report that explains how they reach their decisions and why. And when steps like this are taken and made public, then the First Amendment rights of authors are protected and the rights of readers to get access to books that they would benefit from can also be protected and decisions can be challenged if they're inappropriate. Unfortunately, the evidence shows that the people in charge of deciding who gets to see which books often do not follow these kinds of processes. So for example, the organization PEN America, which represents writers in all different genres and is another free speech bastion. When PEN America analyzed 1,586 book bans uh, from recent years, they found that the guidelines were violated in 98% of the cases. So in only 2% of the cases was a truly thoughtful process engaged in, in challenging books. So one of the problems that we're facing here is books getting banned unfairly and without what you might consider due process. You often have members of school boards or library boards, for example, not even reading books. Uh, there have been cases of, of uh, board members saying, oh, I, I voted against the book. I didn't read it, but I read the reviews and the comments about it so I could tell it was not a good book. Um, so. Uh, one, of the, one of the real issues that we face in battling inappropriate book banning is getting appropriate processes in place and making sure that fair procedures are followed so that books, if they are going to be challenged, will be challenged based on realities and not on fantasies or, or, or political motives that, that are not appropriate. What kinds of books are being challenged today? Well, that's, we're gonna spend a lot of this evening delving into that. When you search the lists of frequently challenged and banned books, which have been compiled by organizations like the American Library Association, certain patterns really jump out and those could be summarized as follows. One is that a lot of books are being challenged if they have to deal, if they deal with uh, LGBTQ topics or characters. 
another group of books are those that deal with sex, abortion, teen pregnancy, or puberty, sexual issues in general, um, uh, are very popular targets for the book banners. Uh, of special concern to us at Repair, books that have to do with race or racism, or that have main characters who are people of color, often get challenged, not necessarily explicitly on those grounds, but that ends up being the, the impact uh, of the books that are, that are banned. And books that have to do with history, especially history of Black people, tend to get challenged more than other categories of books. So some of the very kinds of books that we here at Repair have found to be tremendously valuable in our quest to, to fight for racial justice and equity uh, are the kinds of books that are being targeted by people who want to prevent access to books. Um, when we send out our uh, resource note, we'll include lists of, uh, or uh, links to some of the uh, most popular links, uh, uh, lists of, of most banned books. The American Library Associ Association annually puts out a list of the books that have most frequently been banned or challenged uh, in recent years. The American Civil Liberties Union uh, puts out its own list. Uh, this is their most recent uh, banned books reading list, kind of a top 10 list, which includes books like The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, books like uh, Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, and uh, a, a book by uh, Ibram X. Kendi, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. And Ibram X. Kendi is the speaker who has come to speak to us at Repair. So uh, again, uh, uh, books on race and racism are among those that get uh, singled out most often by the book banners. And it's also important to note that I mentioned schools and libraries as being government facilities where book banning is especially prevalent, but the practice is spreading beyond just those two venues. Here are a couple of examples. Uh, uh, people uh, incarcerated, and of course, you know, we know the huge incarceration rate in the US is a problem unto itself, but people in prison have strict limits on the kinds of reading materials that they can get. Often these are very arbitrary and do not help them with their self-education or their rehabilitation process. And as an example of how arbitrary it can be, here's a recent decision made by uh, the, the leaders of the Michigan prison system that they were going to ban Spanish and Swahili dic dictionaries on the ground that they might incite violence. And the spokesperson said, if certain prisoners decided to learn a very obscure language, they would be able to then speak freely in front of staff about introducing contraband or assaulting staff or assaulting another prisoner. Seems like a bit of a stretch to me. And uh, I can't help but think that Spanish and Swahili have been singled out for perhaps other reasons in this case. Carolyn, um, I'm gonna stop it and ask a question that Catherine, yeah, Catherine offered um, mm -hmm. about, about sources. Uh, um, when you send out the, the, the follow-up um, yes. provide some links to the sources, particularly if she's interested about the about people who aren't following the banning protocol properly. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, we'll we'll send out a, a nice list of articles and uh, websites uh, and uh, and organizations like Penn that are, have been doing the research into uh, into these practices. Another example of how book banning is spreading. Uh, beyond just schools and libraries. Uh, there's a lawsuit uh, underway right now in Virginia uh, that was filed by a couple of uh, candidates, uh, Republican candidates for the Virginia Assembly, uh, trying to get uh, two books, uh, a graphic memoir called Gender Queer and another book called A Court of Mist and Fury, trying to get those declared obscene which would therefore mean that a bookstore like Barnes and Noble is not allowed to make that available to young people. And uh, it could also, uh, if, if their lawsuit is successful, it could uh, uh, bar the booksellers from publicly displaying the books. And uh, it could also prevent libraries from lending them to minors without parental consent. So uh, here we have a case of, of a lawsuit that if it was, if it proves to be successful and it is in process right now, could actually 
uh, limit the freedom of a private organization like Barnes and Noble to uh, disseminate books based on uh, you know, a somewhat uh, uh, arbitrary um, uh, standard of obscenity. So uh, uh, the, once you, this book ban in Genie comes out of the bottle, uh, some of the impacts can be, uh, can be unpredictable. Who is behind the book challenges? Um, as you can imagine, there's you know, many answers for, it, for there, there are thousands of book challenges happening uh, each year in the United States. In many cases, parents are behind them. Uh, when we're talking about schools or uh, school libraries, quite often it's parents who rightly or wrongly feel concerned about what their children are being exposed to and perhaps wanna have greater control over what their children are being exposed to. Um, who are behind the book challenges. Penn America says that about 40% of book uh, challenges uh, involve state officials or elected lawmakers. And in addition, there's a growing number of activist groups, organized groups that are backing book challenges in communities around the country. One example is a group called Moms for Liberty, which believes that parents should have control over uh, everything that their children are exposed to, as you can see, they're also against uh, masking in uh, schools for the kids. <laughs> and Moms for Liberty uh, most recently claimed to have 167 local chapters uh, in 30 states with some 70,000 members who are all supposed to be local parents. Their goal is to have a chapter in every school district in the country so that whenever decisions are being made, their members can be at the meetings uh, and demanding that their preferred policies be followed. So it's not a matter just of individual parents being disturbed about something they hear from their kids. It's also organized groups uh, funded you know, in various ways who are taking this up as a, as a political cause. What harm is done when books are banned? Well, so I, I would say most Americans probably you know, grow up with the with a basic belief in the value of the free di dissemination of ideas. So whenever there's a limitation placed on people's access to ideas and knowledge, that would be you know, a source of concern. And we have to assume that a less well-informed populace is going to be less wise and will make less good decisions. So there's a sort of kind of a basic assumption I think that most of us would make that the spread of information and knowledge in various forms is generally a good thing. And that's violated when books are banned, of course. Um, in the case of books being challenged and possibly removed from circulation, what's also happening is that a, a vocal minority, often a very small minority, is getting control over the information and ideas that everyone has access to, which in itself is an, an anti-democratic kind of practice. And in addition, what's happening right now is that the kinds of books that are being banned now form part of a larger pattern, which again relates closely to what we're doing in repair. Uh, when you look at a state like Florida, Ron DeSantis in this picture has just signed what's called the Don't Say Gay law. And you know, in this case, uh, this is a law which uh, he signed on March 28th which says that uh, classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity uh, may not occur through grade three and uh, may not occur in a manner that is not age appropriate or develop developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. It's been uh, perhaps caricatured as don't say gay and yet a lot of teachers in Florida say they are, they're not really sure what it means and what they're allowed to do. And in effect, many of the people behind the Don't Say uh, Gay ban seem to really want discussions of gender identity beyond the, the strictly conventional and traditional to be outlawed in public schools altogether. And that seems to be what the people behind this law have in mind. Uh, so. Uh, it's linked with the attacks, as we've already mentioned, on a lot of books dealing with LGBTQ themes and also with sexuality. Uh, so 
the book bans are kind of part of a pattern of suppressing certain kinds of information that people are uncomfortable with. Right now, another 12 states or so, including Ohio and Texas, are considering similar laws. So this is not uh, just an isolated example. Critical race theory, which we've talked about in repair, is another target um, rather vaguely defined in, uh, in a number of states. Uh, the, uh, the teaching of so-called critical race theory has been banned so far in six states. And uh, at last count, there were another 15 states where uh, bans uh, have been proposed for critical race theory. And again, because of the vagueness of the laws, it's not totally clear to teachers exactly what this means, but it is being interpreted to be on the safe side in many school districts as really banning any discussion of racism uh, or any critical discussion of the history of race in our society. So this uh, if this becomes a, a national norm, it would, of course, be a huge step backward for having an educated populace and an and America where people at least understand what we're up against when it comes to uh, the fight on behalf of racial uh, equality and, uh, and justice. So um, the, uh, uh, the, the issue of book banning is part of this larger pattern of attempts to suppress certain kinds of ideas and uh, since repair is very much of an, org of an educational organization for all of us who are trying to be part of the solution when it comes to race and racism as opposed to part of the problem, this really strikes against what repair stands for. Ginny, I'm seeing some things piling up in uh, chat. Are th there some ideas and questions that we should pause and, and talk about? Um, some interesting chats. I, uh, Catherine, maybe um, at, at some point you can send us your email because Catherine says that it, um, in Georgia, she can speak to some of the, the issues related to critical race theory and, mm -hmm. and that's being manipulated there. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, so maybe you know, sometime in, in, our, in our next session, we can, we can wrap Catherine into the discussion to kind of spread our geography a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. I mean, this is very much of a national issue. And uh, actually, while we were preparing this class, uh, uh, this program, Gwen sent me a couple of articles from local Westchester newspapers that indicated that these same controversies are cropping up here. So yeah, that's one thing that I wanted to, because Catherine said, you know, that this is, uh, Georgia has been pretty hard hit by the, by this idea of banned books. But I just wanted to assure you that you know, you're not alone. That we, our own school systems here in New York have very active, um, somewhat horrifying conversations along that same line. Yeah. Um, Linda um, also uh, just uh, remarks that there that, that there's a link to, I think that the ALA uh, top 100 banned and challenges books, which I think Carl, you were gonna share um, as a resource. Yeah, and, for sure. uh, and then there's also a question, and I, I don't know the answer to this uh, about, from Barbara about whether the warmth of other suns has been banned on, I haven't seen it on a list, but I'm wondering if you have Carl. I don't know. I, I'm, I have the uh, the ALA list of the 100 most often banned books in front of me, and I'm flipping through it. I don't see that title here. I, I try to uh, zero in on books that are <laughs> classics uh, on race relations. So, so things like uh, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou uh, are on this list. Uh, the Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, which is a recent bestseller, is on the list, but I, but I don't see that one. So um, that, that doesn't mean it hasn't been challenged. It uh, could well be, but it hasn't made the, the top 100, the, the billboard list it hasn't made yet. Um, okay. Um, the last question on my list here for our conversation is what can we do to push, push back against book banning? And this is something I think we'll come back to throughout the, the rest of the evening. Um, one way to push back, of course, is to be involved with uh, local and also national government, which is exactly what the people and organizations that are trying to ban books have done a good job of doing. They've become organized, created groups, and, and they show up at school board meetings and uh, library board meetings, and they write to their members of Congress. And Congress is getting engaged in this issue. This is an article from a recent uh, hearing uh, 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 led by some uh, Democrats in Congress 
who want to push back against the book banning uh, trend and uh, so uh, offering support to officials who are uh, trying to push back against book banning is certainly something that we can do as citizens. Um, legislators who want to defend this kind of freedom uh, deserve our, uh, our support. And of course, you know, the more widely you yourself read and delve into um, uh, supposedly dangerous uh, or inappropriate books, the better you'll be in a position to judge for yourself, to make informed decisions about which kinds of books deserve to be and ought to be part of the national dialogue. And growing numbers of people and organizations around the country are actually taking this tack, which is to, to actually adopt banned books as books that deserve to be examined. Because uh, if someone feels as though uh, the ideas in a particular book um, might threaten the status quo, perhaps that means that book is, is worth a second look and maybe has ideas that we, we might not agree with every idea that's in them, but uh, perhaps they will open some minds and help us discover new ways of thinking about our, our country, our history, and where we need to go. Uh, one example, a story from uh, Cutstown, Pennsylvania, an eighth grader named Jocelyn Diffenbaugh uh, became disturbed about the fact that books had been removed from her school curriculum and from her school library. And so she got together with a bunch of her classmates and with the help of uh, her mom and the local Firefly bookstore, they actually started a forbidden book club uh, for teenagers where they're gathering monthly and uh, each month they're reading a different recently banned book and discussing what they can learn from it. Um, uh, groups like this uh, across the country could be an amazing way to, uh, to get a lot of young people to learn a lot of amazing new things. The New York City Public Library uh, has launched a program which they're calling the Banned Books Challenge, and they've come up with their own list of 10 highly recommended challenged books. The first one at the top of their list right now is uh, Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe, which uh, I believe uh, it, it involves race as one, as one of its themes. And uh, uh, they're, they're asking supporters of the library to, uh, to read and discuss these banned books uh, as a gesture of support for ideas of all kinds. So in the spirit of, of reading banned books and making sure that challenged ideas get their, uh, uh, their chance to be heard in the form of public opinion, uh, we're gonna take the next uh, portion of our program and take a close look at a handful of most frequently banned books that specific members of our organizing committee have a, uh, a soft spot in our hearts for. And we're gonna present our own uh, views and uh, thoughts about these specific banned books. And those of you who are uh, not members of our organizing committee but are visiting with us tonight, uh, you might want to go ahead and start adding in chat the books that, that you've read that perhaps you've heard have been on a banned list or that you suspect might be and uh, uh, that have been uh, eye-opening books for you, uh, specifically about race, but about any topic that you, uh, you think deserves a, a, a hearing. And uh, later uh, in the course of this evening, we'll, we'll look at some of your selections. Uh, it might be uh, a great source of ideas for summer reading for, for all of us. The first of, of our group of five that we've selected that we'd like to talk about is the oldest one. We're gonna do these kind of in chronological order. And I'm, I'm gonna take this one. This is, was my choice. I have a feeling a number of you have, uh, have read this one, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting example because it's an old book. It's a, it's a, it's a classic, widely regarded as a classic. Um, and yet it has been controversial and frequently banned ever since it was first published in 1885. But what's fascinating about it is that it has been challenged and banned on many different grounds in many different places for many different reasons and continues to be banned and challenged to this day, despite the fact that it is widely admired and respected as an important work of American literature. In fact, you know, when I was studying American literature at Fordham all those years ago, 
uh, we all we all read what uh, Ernest Hemingway said about Huckleberry Finn. You, many of you have heard this one. 1935, uh, Ernest Hemingway said, all modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. It's the best <laughs> book we've had. Now, <laughs> whether you're a Hemingway fan or not, that's, uh, that's high praise. And I think Hemingway said this because uh, among other things, Huckleberry Finn was one of the first books to really successfully embrace the American vernacular. In the late uh, 1800s, uh, large swaths of the American literary scene were still um, laboring under a, a genteel idea of what was appropriate literature. And they were kind of imitating European and particularly British models and trying very hard to look like American writers were, were, were well washed behind the ears and to get any sense of of uh, frontier crudeness out of their writing. Well, Mark Twain decided to violate all that and said, you know, I'm gonna write like a kid from, from the frontier and I'm gonna make a great piece of literature out of it. And for many people, Huckleberry Finn is the book where he comes closest uh, to doing that. Um, it has been challenged over the years, countless times. When it was first published, I think a lot of schools, librarians and critics were uncomfortable with it simply because they felt the language was very crude, which it is because it's written in the voice of a kid from, uh, from the frontier. Uh, Huck Finn himself is the narrator. Uh, so that's undeniably true. And yet it's also why the book is so, so true to life and why it captures something of reality in a way that you know, the more genteel writers of the era were, were never able to do. It also offers a powerful satire and indictment of slavery and of racism. Uh, 1885, of course, slavery had been abolished by then, but racism was certainly in full flower. And Mark Twain uh, mercilessly uh, exposes the hypocrisy of racism in Huckleberry Finn, which is certainly one of the reasons why the book has been unpopular among white supremacist or uh, racist uh, parts of our society. And of course, today it's also quite controversial because Twain does use, I think two, there are 291 instances in which the N-word is used in the book. And there have been editions published in which the word is expunged or changed into a different word. And there are arguments on both sides as to what would be appropriate. He's putting it in the mouth of, of Huck Finn and of the other characters in the book who would have used this term in in the, at that time. Today, of course, it's not language that would be used, nor should it be used. It's language over which people are rightfully sensitive and which we would want to avoid using. Um, so it's not an easy question to answer whether Huck Finn deserves to be uh, uh, expunged in some way because of the N-word, among other things. When I was talking to uh, Dennis Parker, from our organizing committee, he was saying that he hates the idea of watering down a great classic like Huck Finn. But uh, there could be more than one valid opinion about it. But, um, uh, and you might be, want to be thoughtful about what age a person should be uh, before they read Huck Finn and about the way in which the book is presented. But uh, clearly the strong anti-racist message is really at the heart of the book and, uh, taken in combination with the use of the n-word it creates uh, something that is a very real document of its time and I think an important an important state important statement about American society um, I'm going to close by reading uh, a page from Huck Finn and this is kind of the, the, the most famous page in the book um, Huck Finn has uh, escaped from um, Miss Watson, the elderly lady who's been raising him with an iron hand and traveled on the Mississippi with a, an escaped slave named Jim, who is actually Miss Watson's slave, uh, an enslaved person named Jim. And they've become deeply, deeply close as friends. But midway through the book, Huck Finn is realizing that Miss Watson is surely very upset that Jim has escaped. And he's feeling really guilty about it because he was raised from a child to believe that slavery is good and that anyone who helps slaves and befriends a, an N-word 
is no good and is surely going to hell. He's been raised with, uh, with that idea of what Christian morality means. So he comes to the decision that the right thing for him to do is to turn in Jim, to make sure that he is captured by the slave hunters and sent back to slavery. And he actually writes a note to Miss Watson telling him where Jim is so that she can send the slave hunters to catch him and bring him back to, um, uh, to slavery. Uh, and this is what then happens in Huck Finn's mind. I felt good and all washed clean of sin for the first time I had ever felt so in my life. And I knowed I could pray now. But I didn't do it straight off, but laid the paper down and sat there thinking, thinking how good it was all this happened so, and how near I come to being lost and going to hell. And I went on thinking and got to thinking over our trip down the river. And I see Jim before me all the time in the day and in the nighttime, sometimes moonlight, sometimes storms, and we are floating along talking and singing and laughing. But somehow I couldn't seem to strike no places to harden me against him but only the other kind. I'd see him standing my watch on top of his and instead of calling me so I could go on sleeping and see him how glad he was when I come back out of the fog. And when I come to him again in the swamp up there where the feud was and such like times and would always call me honey and pet me and do everything he could think of for me and how good he always was. And at last I struck the time I saved him by telling the men we had smallpox aboard and he was so grateful and said I was the best friend old Jim ever had in the world and the only one he's got now. And then I happened to look around and see that paper. It was a close place. I took it up and held it in my hand. I was a trembling because I'd got to decide forever betwixt two things and I noted. it. I studied a minute, sort of holding my breath and then says to myself, all right, then, I'll go to hell and tore it up. <laughs> That's why many of us love Huckleberry Finn. Lee, I'm going to ask you to talk about the book that you chose. But uh, before we do, uh, Ginny, are there any comments or questions we should? There, there's some really neat comments I'd, I'd direct everyone to to take a look at the chat at some point there's a you know there's a, a list of books that people are, are are tossing out as you know having been either challenged or banned yeah. you know mm -hmm. things that people really hold close like you know, mm -hmm. you know beloved and and mm -hmm. and Runner, know why the cage bird sings to kill a mm -hmm. mockingbird color purple which janice mm -hmm. talked about a little bit so mm -hmm. um there's um and also books like you know ulysses and 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 mm -hmm. 22 and perhaps even born on the fourth of july not clear about that but just that you know books that are you know, because they have controversial topics, but they get, you know, people don't want to talk about anti-war narratives, so they, you know, focus on it has bad language, you know, that those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Right, so, right. Um, so I'll turn it back to Lee for Malcolm X. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the point of departure for me um, when, when Carl sent this out and, and I found out what we we're going to be talking about, I immediately thought of this idea that um, one, one of the Sort of animating forces behind the the, the current banned book craze, um, I think it you know is articulated something like we shouldn't be making white kids or white folks read things that's going to make them feel bad about themselves, mm -hmm. right? Like that's a uh, you know that's that there's there's something absolute and absolutely bad about that, and of course um, you know that can mean that can mean different things. There's probably a huge continuum from, come on, what are you kidding to maybe something sort of more legitimate. Um, and, and I have to admit, as look, as a white American, there are, you could almost open any page of the, the autobiography of Malcolm X and read something that will make you kind of cringe a little bit for have for being a white American. The, the question you got to ask, or the question I ask myself is, is, is what I'm reading that's making me cringe a little bit. Is it gratuitous? Is it untruthful? You know, what, what's behind it? And, and I think, you know, just sort of stepping back, I think sort of that behind all this debate, I think really needs to be, what, it, what, are, we, what are we about? Are we about learning history? Are we about taking on challenging um, ideas, um, not 
that we have to um, completely subscribe to them? Or are we about um, avoiding those ideas? And if the answer is the latter, you got to kind of ask yourself, what, you know, what's up with that? What, you know, why? Anyhow, um, the, uh, um, just the, the, um, when, when Alex Haley in the, in the afterward talked about um, taking on this project with Malcolm X and he had proposed it, somebody had asked him to um, first write an article about uh, Malcolm X. And this was, you know, really when he was sort of at the height of his fame, you know, uh, early sixties um, and then a book, he asked Malcolm X um, uh, if he could do it. And he thought about it and he said, um, I'll, I'll do it, but nothing can be in it that I didn't say. And anything that I want to be in it has to go in it. And, um, and, and sort of there's, a, there's a, an interesting um, story that's sort of told in the epilogue where after he famously broke from the nation of Islam and they were, um, you know, they basically set out to, to um, silence him and then ultimately to kill him. Um, he was reading, it was right at about the time the, you know, much of the book was written, was pretty much all done. He was reading proofs and he went through um, a, and, and, you know, changed a whole bunch of stuff. And Alex Haley asked him, Malcolm, do you, are you sure you want to do this? Remember what you said up front. You wanted an absolutely honest book, and um, and he said, "Look, as a as a writer, um, what I'm really fearful of is going back and turning this into a polemic against uh, uh, the Nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad." And Malcolm X said, "You know what? You're absolutely right. Leave it all in um, as is." So. Um, I think that, you know, apart from, you know, just some, some of the subject matter, and it is really, um, um, it, it's a, it, 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 the arc of the story is it's his early life. And he's absolutely honest the, through the entire book about um, his, his life growing up, uh, his father being, um, uh, you know, being killed by white supremacists, his family um, basically being dissolved, his living on the streets, selling dope, breaking into houses, eventually being put in prison, which um, was where he really, he really had his conversion, right? He, he, I, I almost think of it as a double conversion. He had the conversion um, on our topic of being introduced to um, literature and history in the in a prison library that he describes as having been, um, you know, very well stocked, um, and then of course the conversion to um, to uh, Islam and specifically to the nation of of Islam. And it, curious, it, interestingly, as I was looking at Google um, for you know the autobiography of Malcolm X and its history as a banned book, one of the places it was banned. Uh, recently was in the Tennessee state prison system, which is just ironic since that's where he really discovered books and discovered his, his voice. Um, and so it, it's brutally honest then about his um, uh, joining the nation of Islam and really becoming the outside voice, the, 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 um, uh, the outside facing um, uh uh, mouthpiece for the Nation of Islam, which was, let's be fair, let's be honest, was, um, uh, you know, very, um, it was not about integration. This was, this was about Black self-empowerment, self-determination, um, the, uh, the, like I said, on every page, there is, there is um, example after example about how Black Americans have been treated since they arrived on these shores, and how it has not been, um, it, 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 it has really made their lives difficult. Um, and eventually, um, he becomes the number two person and is 
really one of the faces of the civil rights movement. You know, he's all, when I was a kid, it was always, um, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and they were sort of this, this, these polar opposites, which when you read the book, you, you realize that was, you know, that was one of those um, ideas that we get from, um, you know, handed down to us that maybe isn't completely accurate. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, and eventually he, um, uh, he leaves the nation of Islam, he becomes a little disaffected. There's some, um, uh, 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 some paternity suits for Elijah Muhammad. Yeah, he, he becomes disaffected and then they, they go after him. And um, uh, it's just, a, it, the, the book itself, I just have to say, it's just a powerful, dramatic read. The arc of his, the, 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 um, uh, the honesty, the forthrightness um, that uh, he uses to just describe what it has been for him to live in America um, as a black man and what his, what his life and his struggle has been like is um, something, frankly, that I think every American should read, period, should not be banned, should be required. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lee. It's a great, I, and as I wrote in chat, I, I love the movie too, I have to say. The Spike Lee, Denzel mm -hmm. Washington movie. Mm -hmm. I, th I, I think it's a brilliant film. Thank you so much, Lee. And I want to click to our next, our next often banned, often challenged book, The Color Purple, Alice Walker. Janice, tell us about why this is a, a special book for you. Janice, you're on mute. I'll bet most of you have encountered The Color Purple, even if you haven't read it as a novel. It was a hugely successful movie, a Broadway musical, and a film adaptation of that musical will be released December 23, just in time for the holidays. <laughs> Published in 1983, the novel earned its author, Alice Walker, the first Pulitzer Prize awarded to a black woman. It also won the National Book Award for Fiction and was cited by PBS among the top 100 great American novels. Now this was Alice Walker's third novel. Her first work was a volume of poetry which she published as she was graduating from Sarah Lawrence. The Color Purple is also number 17 on the American Library Association's list of top banned or challenged books schools and even prisons have banned it. The reason cited religious objections, glorification of lesbianism, violence, African history, rape, incest, drug abuse, explicit language, sexual scenes. And it's true. These are elements of the plot or themes explored by Alice Walker in the masterpiece. Not cited as a reason for banning, but I'm very suspicious, especially since most of the challenges have come from the South. While white characters are not at the forefront of the novel as characters, they certainly dominate the destinies of all of the black characters. Whites are portrayed as vindictive, careless, cruel, demeaning. Only one white character makes a feeble attempt to rectify years of domination and only in the particular circumstance of making amends to the black woman who has loved and raised her to a greater extent than her own mother. Mm. When Walker considers the color purple, she sees something else entirely. In 2006, in the updated preface, she wrote that the novel was to her a theological work, examining the journey from the religious back to the spiritual, exploring the difficult path of someone who starts out in life a spiritual captive and through courage and help of others breaks free to the realization of herself as a radiant expression of the divine. Mm. The Color Purple presents the lives of Celia and her family from her 14th year to late middle age and is structured as a series of letters from Celia to God or her sister Nettie and from Nettie to Celia. Like Huck Finn or the works of Faulkner, 
The narrators are unreliable. The reader has to carefully consider what Seeley says about herself and others around her, whether it's fair or true. For example, early in the novel, Seeley and many around her proclaim her as ugly. Later in the novel, her children are described as beautiful and as looking like her, and as looking like her sister Nettie, who Seeley says is beautiful. So how ugly can Seeley be? What are the roots of her self-loathing? What makes someone beautiful? But the story has remained controversial, even among Blacks. The Hollywood chapter of the NAACP picketed the opening of the film. Ishmael Reed, a noted Black writer nominated for the Pulitzer and the National Book Award, labeled Walker a kamikaze feminist and a pawn of Gloria Steinem. Journalist Tony Brown devoted an entire episode of his show to bashing the book as the most racist depiction of black men since the birth of a nation. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that the book has not been criticized for its use of the vernacular. Because the novel is composed as a series of letters written by a woman isolated in a small town in the deep south before World War II, a woman who was intentionally deprived of formal schooling, the main character speaks as she naturally would, rather than using standard academic English. My high school students in Westchester on occasion had a hard time understanding that voice and even the plot. I'd compare the language used to Faulkner, who also presents Southern first person voices who are unreliable. So there are many reasons to read this book and to teach this book. As a teacher, I felt keenly the responsibility to provide literary role models in authors and characters and to explore and celebrate differences. Yes, whites and many blacks and Africans even are revealed as highly flawed. In each case though, readers can ask themselves why? What causes someone to behave like a monster? What gives someone the courage to fight back? Is fighting worth the consequences? Walker subtly explains the roots of black male violence and black female sexuality and of African indifference to Western culture and even perhaps their complicity in slavery. Careful readers even see some reasons, not excuses, for white insistence on domination of blacks. But read the color purple because it is a great and ultimately uplifting story. Our main character overcomes many more hardships than David Copperfield or Jane Eyre through its choices of structure and plot, a voice which could have been overlooked is made entirely admirable. And I'm going to read to you from the middle of the novel. Oh, my dimness has gone on because it's past there. Now I can read it again. Okay, um, from the middle of the novel, and this is our main character, Seely, speaking about her daughter-in-law, Sophia, who, if you saw the movie, was played by Oprah Winfrey. Sophia would make a dog laugh, talking about those people she worked for. They have the nerve to try to make us think slavery fell through because of us, say Sophia like us didn't have sense enough to handle it. All the time breaking hoe handles and letting the mules loose in the wheat. But how anything they build can last a day is a wonder to me. They backward, she say. And unlucky, clumsy. Mayor bought Miss Lizzie a new car because she said if colored could have a car, then one for her was past due. So he bought her a car only he refused to show her how to drive it. Every day he come home from town, he look at her, look out the window at the car and say, how you enjoying her, that car, Miss Millie? She fly off the sofa in a huff, slam the door going to the bathroom. She ain't got no friends. So one day she say to me, car been sitting out the yard two months, Sophia. Do you know how to drive it? I guess she remembered first seeing me up against Buster, Broad, Buster Broadnack's car. Yes, ma'am, I say. 
I'm slaving away, cleaning that big post they got down the bottom of the stair. That real funny about that post. No fingerprints is supposed to be on it ever. Do you think you could teach me, she said. So I say, yes, ma'am, I can teach you if it's the same kind of car I learned on. Next thing you know, there go me and Ms. Millie all up and down the road. First I drive and she watch. Then she start to try to drive and I watch her up and down the road. Soon as I finish cooking breakfast, putting it on the table, washing the dishes, sweeping the floor, and just before I go get the mail out at the box before the road, we go and give Miss Millie her driving lesson. Well, after a while, she got the hang of it, more or less. Then she'd get really good at it. And one day when we come home from riding, she say to me, I'm going to drive you home. Just like that. Home, I asked. Yes, she say, home. You ain't been home and seen your children in a while, she say. Ain't that right? I say, yes, ma'am. It's been five years. <laughs> she say, that's a shame. You just go get your things right now. Here it is Christmas. Go get your things. You can stay all day. For all day, I don't need nothing but what I got on, I say. Fine, she say, fine, well, get in. Well, say Sophia, I was so used to sitting up there next to her teaching her how to drive that I just naturally climbed up in the front seat. She stood outside on her side of the car, clearing her throat. Finally, she say, Sophia, with a little laugh, this is the South. I say, yes, ma'am. She clear her throat, laugh some more. Look where you sitting, she say. I'm sitting where I always sit, I say. That's the problem, she say. Have you ever seen a white person and a colored person sitting side by side in a car when one of them wasn't showing the other how to drive it or clean it? <laughs> Janice, thank you. you. You know, you had some lucky students when you were teaching <laughs> high school. Really appreciate that. Well, I made them read this one for summer reading. <laughs> <laughs> Before we read Fawn. Thank you, Janice. Sure. Carolyn Black, you selected The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Would you like to share with us why and what you love about this book? Well, I, I read this book a long, long time ago, and I, I was a lot younger when I read it. <laughs> and uh, things were... Uh, strange for me when I did read it and since I read it I've been reading it recently I just am appalled at why I read it the first time uh, without the wisdom that I think I have now that might be debatable by some but um, <laughs> The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison um, is one of the biggest band books uh, almost on every list. Um, I'm going to read some of it, some of a uh, part of it to you. Um, it's the story of Piccola Breedlove, who is a, a young Black girl who prays for blue eyes because she thinks that having blue eyes would make her pretty and would also make her beautiful. Uh, and it would be the one thing that she uh, could do that would be make her accepted by blacks and whites alike. Um, she prays every day for beauty, and she mock, she's she's mocked or teased by other children all of her life because she has very dark skin and she has curly hair and brown eyes um, that had set her apart. And she yearns for the blonde hair, of course, and the blue eyes that she believes will finally make her fit in. Yet as her, oh, oh, also her, um, her dream person in this whole scenario is, um, uh, oh my gosh, there goes my brain. 
um, the doll, um, my brain again, um, uh, Shirley Temple, because she has the blonde hair with the curls and she has, um, she has blue eyes and everybody seems to love her. So if she could get these things, she would also be lovable. Um, this is a brilliant cumul accumulation of everything about obsession. It has racism beyond belief. Mm. It has incest. It has rape. It has all kinds of alcoholism and all kinds of abuse that are heaped not only on her, but on her mother and by her father. Um, she is raped twice by her father and she, um, she has his baby and the first, after the first rape and her mother of course does not believe her. Um, she doesn't believe that her husband did this to her, um, her daughter. And um, they plant marigolds, she and her friends, all around in the garden, praying that if the marigolds live, so will her baby. Mm. But the marigolds die, and so does her baby. Um, I want to read you a part of about her mother. Her mother is the only one in the house who has a job and um, in the house um, she she has this job where she works for this white lady who of course has a beautiful house everything is uh, clean and neat and she can put everything in order and she has a daughter with blonde hair and blue eyes and she spends her time every day with this family. And she gets to the point where she is not tending to her own home. One day, uh, and her name, her name is Pauline. Pauline kept this order, this beauty for herself, a private world and never introduced into her storefront or to her children. Them she bent toward respectability and in so doing taught them fear, fear of being clumsy, fear of being like their father, fear of not being loved by God, fear of being uh, having the madness like Charlie's mother, Charlie is the father. Into her son, she beat a loud desire to run away and into her daughter, she beat a fear of growing up a fear of other people and a fear of life. All the meaningfulness of her life was in her work for her virtues were intact. She was an active church woman. She did not drink, smoke or carouse. She defended herself mightily against Charlie. She rose above him in every way and she felt that she was fulfilling a mother's role conscientiously when she pointed out their father's faults to keep them from having them or punished them when they showed any slovenliness, no matter how slight, when she worked 12 to 16 hours a day to support them and the world itself agreed with her. It was only sometimes, sometimes, and then rarely that she thought about the old days and what her life had turned to. There were musings and idle thoughts and full sometimes of the old dreaminess, but not of the kind of thing that she cared to dwell on. She started to leave Charlie once, but she decided against it, but she can't remember why she decided not to. I want to read you a portion of what she says, well, the narrator says about Charlie. When Charlie was four days old, his mother wrapped him in two blankets and one newspaper and placed him on a junk heap by the railroad. His great aunt, Jimmy, 
who had seen her niece carry this bundle out the back door, rescued him. She beat his mother with a razor strap and she wouldn't let her near the baby after that. Aunt Jimmy raised Charlie herself, but she took delight sometimes in telling him of how she had saved him. He gathered from her that his mother wasn't right in the head, but he never had a chance to find out because he ran away shortly after the razor strap and no one has heard of her since. Charlie was grateful for having been saved. I got you and I named you on the ninth day. You are named after my dead brother, Charles Breedlove, a good man. Ain't no Samson ever come to no good end. Charlie didn't ask anything less. Two years later, he quit school to take a job at Tyson's Feed and Grain Store. This was after four years of schooling. A nice old man named Blue Jack used to tell him old timey stories about how it was when the Emancipation Proclamation came, how the black people hollered and cried and sang and ghost stories about how a white man cut off his wife's head and buried her in the swamp. And the headless body came out at night and went stumbling around the yard, knocking over stuff because it couldn't see and crying all the time for a comb. They talked about the woman, women Blue had had and the fights he'd been in when he was younger about how he talked his way out of getting lynched once, about how he talked about his women. Mm. This book is divided into four sections. Uh, and the themes are summer, winter, autumn, and spring. It was published in 1970 and in the first theme is about race and social class. African Americans are met with racism and social injustice at every turn in this book. It is set in Lorraine, Ohio, in the North, which was in the North at that time. And slavery and segregation cast a shadow of lives of African Americans. And the Great Depression comes up, and even the whites have a rough time during this period of time. But for blacks, it is worse than anywhere else, anyone else, for anyone else. In 1941, under gender and black girlhood, that's the, the second theme. In 1941, women were particularly vulnerable and largely dependent on men. Pauline Breedlove, as Piccola's mother is the sole breadwinner of the house. And she's subject to awful abuse by her husband. He beats her, he degrades her in every way possible. The fourth one is the white standards of beauty. Piccola longs for blue eyes, embodied in the dolls that she has been given for Christmas, and she loves Shirley Temple. Mm. While her life was riddled with abuse and terrible behavior, she believes that blue eyes would make her life affluent and she would be so different and become ideal. No black standards of beauty happened at that time. So we've got abuse. The family is marked by abuse. Charlie batters Pauline. He's alcoholic. He rapes his daughter twice. He's abused himself by old white men at a, at a oh gosh, as a, a teenager, he has been taught to have sex with older women and while these old white men watch him do this. Ooh. Nicola's brother, Junior, kills his mother's cat. 
and Piccola Poisons Church. Now, this is a, a neighbor, church's neighbor's dog. Inadvertently, she gives him um, some poisoned food. But she's tricked into doing this under and we've got religion and faith healing from this man named Soaphead Church. And he is a faith healer and he swears that if she does this, gives this food to this dog who evidently has scared him at some point, he swears that she will have blue eyes and blonde hair wow. when she does this. Yeah. Of course, this doesn't happen, yeah. but she does poison the dog. And in the end of the story, she regrets all of her life and she eventually winds up in the crazy house. Mm, wow. She loses her mind. Yeah. It's such a sad story. It, it sounds so intense and so powerful. It is so intense. And I'm having a hard time rereading it. <laughs> <laughs> with, Carolyn, with thank you. This has, been, this has been amazing. And, uh, you know, those of us who haven't already read The Bluest Eye, I mean. Please it, read it. Yeah, it sounds it's like something none of us should miss. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we had uh, one other title. Uh, that was selected by uh, Dennis Parker from our organizing committee. And Dennis, uh, unfortunately, had to do a last minute work obligation tonight. And I spoke with Dennis earlier today and asked him to tell me a little bit about why Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Between the World and Me, means so much to him. Let's, let's listen to him for a few moments. So Dennis, one of the frequently challenged and banned books uh, that we've seen on lists is Ta-Nehisi Coates's book, Between the World and Me. And this is one that you selected that you'd like to talk about. Could you share with our uh, a little bit about, about this book and why it's meaningful to you? Ta-Nehisi's book is meaningful for me for a number of reasons. Number one, I think the work that he does in general is really important. He's made visible things that had been invisible for too long, starting with, with some of his, his articles on reparations in Atlantic, um, and then going on through all of the books that he's written. Um, Between the World and Me, though, is, is particularly powerful because it is a tie to the past. It's in the form of a letter to his son talking about what to expect, um, what are the, the issues that, that Black men in particular face, but that Black people in general face. And in, I said it's a tie to the past because the title itself is, is from something written by Richard Wright. And the form is a reflection of, of a piece written by James Baldwin to his nephew years ago. And one of the things that's striking to me is how, me how many of the same issues that were mentioned by Baldwin years ago are issues in terms of fear of violence, a, uh, a sense of, 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 of having to be um, mindful of, of the possibility of things happening, the, the, the sense of still being treated as an outsider in the country. You know, these are common, common themes that, that, that run through Baldwin and, and, and Coates and, you know, of course, many other people writing. And the fact that still, you know, well into the 21st century, that there is a need to have a book of instructions on basically how to stay alive for young black people um, is, um, is saddening, but it is also just a beautifully written book. Um, and I think it captures um, a, a lot of the issues that are faced by black people in general, but in a way that, that is both relatable, but also you know, very beautifully stated often. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, 
I, I think it's an important lesson for everyone because it it is a good portrayal of the world, the different world that Black people live in in the United States very often. So for someone who is like myself, who's not a Black person, uh, what if I read this book, what will, what do you think I will take away from it? What's the benefit or the, the learning that, that I'll be able to enjoy from, from reading this book? I think, you know, basically being, being able to realize that many things that, that some people take for granted are not at all the experiences of other people. Um, and I think even the act, you know, I, I've heard an interview with Coates where he talks about how there's nothing new in the book. He had told his son each of these things at some point over his life, but he liked the 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 fact that it it cre it created a structure for him to talk about all of these issues about black life. Mm -hmm. um, and and so when you realize that 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 you live in a world where where you are aware of the fact that 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 you are regarded in certain ways by other people that there will be opportunities that you don't have that you know the threat of violence and not just police violence but all sorts of violence are more a part of life i think getting that perspective on 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 american society is an important one and again i think you know what I like about Coates in general is the fact that that he writes about things that that not all people are aware of. And I talked about his his article about reparations. One of the things that he did was to was to cast a light on the role of black people in the formation and the creation of the country, starting back in the time when people were enslaved, but continuing through the Jim Crow era and up to, to, to uh, today. And what's striking for me about all of his writing is, is how much it demonstrates how vital, not just important, but vital Black contributions have been to the construction of this country, even going back to the time when it was not the result of choice, but of involuntary uh, solitude. So much of the wealth, so many of the things that built the country could not have happened um, without the activity of Black people. But even at, after the end of, of slavery, the, the, the contributions continued. Um, they continued in the form of people serving in the army, paying taxes, being citizens, but not getting the benefits um, of that citizenship. So, you know, the irony of, of paying taxes um, that don't go to support education adequately. In your that, neighborhood. In, in your neighborhood that, that, that go to, um, to finance middle-class housing, but not housing that would be available to you because of redlining mm -hmm. um, that, that go to pay for police departments that, that frequently don't protect you and too often victimize you, you know, all of those things. And in spite of that, you know, Black people continue to contribute to society in so many different ways. And so I think this is a good reminder The fact that books like the ones we've been talking about tonight and many of the other widely banned, widely challenged books, like some of the ones on the screen right now, the fact, the idea that these books do not deserve to be widely read and understood by millions of people of all backgrounds uh, just is very strange. So the idea that these are books that deserve or somehow should be banned uh, it just seems very, very wrong to me. And uh, I hope and believe many of you must agree. Ginny, um, before we wrap up for the evening, uh, are there some final comments and questions that we ought to listen to? I've been sort of mindful of the time, but I do want to draw people's attention to the comments. There have been some really interesting um, 
comments written there about um, the, you know, Carlos comment that um, the bluest eye is a classic example of internalized racial, uh, racial oppression. Mm. Um, and also Barbara's important comments about going back, Carl, to what you were saying about what is lost when books are banned and mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 you know, the reality that so much of what people are against in the color purple are issues that need to be explored in order to, order to heal from much trauma. So the opportunity for people to be, you know, healed and seen through literature is lost when these books are banned, as well as, you know, the, the, just the power uh, you know, something like the uh, autobiography of Malcolm X, that power of what reading means um, and, and how that is illustrated so deeply in that book. And again, these these lessons are lost when these books are when these books aren't made available. So I just wanted to draw, draw people's attention to some really terrific comment comments yeah. that in the chat. So true. Thank, thank you so much for that. And I saw, I just took a quick glance at the comments and I see uh, the, uh, the 1619 project as another example of, of an important uh, work of scholarship that uh, many now are trying to uh, suppress or prevent students from studying, uh, perhaps because the message and the information that it contains uh, makes some people uncomfortable. But, you know, discomfort is one of the ways that we grow. And uh, unless we come to grips with the things that are most challenging in our own stories and the story of our country, uh, we're never going to overcome the things that have caused the the traumas the pain the suffering and the unfairness of the past so um you know that's uh what certainly one of the messages i'm taking away from from this evening so that concludes our program for tonight gwen would you uh care to walk us through a couple of closing remarks before we say good night sure um uh, just we wanted to uh remind everybody about some upcoming Juneteenth celebrations this coming Saturday in Irvington, the third annual Juneteenth celebration uh, from two to six. And uh, where's that? That's in the school, it's in the library parking. Uh, no, the, main, the Main Street School parking lot. The Main Street School parking lot. Uh, there's also a Juneteenth celebration on the Austin Riverfront at 12 noon, and Peekskill is having a celebration on the Riverfront. Um, and uh, then talking about our monthly e-newsletter, uh, please send uh, your email to info at repairrivertowns.org. We send about two uh, emails a month you know, in our program season, fall in, into beginning of summer. And um, the, the email, uh, check it out. This uh, coming one, I'll talk about fall programs. The, the upcoming ones, we'll talk about fall programs, meeting resource lists from this meeting, for example, and other information. And also check out our... Uh, Facebook page and uh, at Repair River Towns. And that has a lot of uh, up-to-date information. It's updated daily with articles, resources, et cetera. Um, and now we have a closing prayer from Kevin. Uh, pray with me. <clears throat> Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us show so love. Where there is injury, pardon where there is discord, union, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody, especially the members of our organizing committee who presented some of the books that have been most meaningful to them. Hope you all enjoyed this evening. Have a great rest of your evening, and uh, we'll see you in the fall uh, if we don't uh, have an opportunity to cross paths with you in the summer. Have a wonderful time and get a little rest and relaxation, and please stay healthy. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks Good night. a lot, everyone. Good night. Good night. Great program. Thanks. <laughs>